Today I'm continuing to talk about the mercy of God even in the Old Covenant. Even when God destroyed the earth with a flood or destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, if you look at it properly, this was an act of mercy. That needs to be explained, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm completing our third week of teaching on the true nature of God. And I tell you, this is vital that you understand this. You know, I teach on the grace of God and talk about the mercy and the goodness of God and some people struggle with that because they have such an impression of God that He's harsh and He's angry and God hates sin. And those are two different views. Is God angry at us because of our sin or is God merciful? Which is it? Well, there was a period of time that God vented His anger upon sin. That was the Old Testament law. But that was only temporary, and I've been showing during the last few days that for the first 2,000 years after man sinned, God did not vent his wrath. He was operating in mercy, not imputing man's trespasses unto them. That's what it says in Romans 5.13. So what I've done is go back to the book of Genesis, and we've shown that when God drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, he did it in mercy in love for them, not in punishment. He didn't drive them away from His presence, but instead He drove them away from the tree of life so that they wouldn't have the ability to live forever in a corrupted, sinful state. That's actually an act of mercy. And then I've shown in Genesis chapter 4 that God was still walking and talking with Adam and Eve. He communicated to them about uh, sacrifices. He told Cain about bringing the first fruits of the ground as a sacrifice. He had some visible or audible manifestation that showed acceptance for Abel's offering, rejection for Cain's offering. He talked to Cain in an audible voice. Right after Cain had killed his brother Abel, an audible voice from God came out of heaven. And Cain's reaction to this audible voice of God while he still had his brother's blood on his hands showed that he was so familiar with the presence of God and the audible voice of God that he must have heard God speak to him on nearly a daily basis. See, God was still walking and talking with man. And then, how did God deal with this first murderer? Well, there were consequences to his sin. The earth wasn't going to yield its strength anymore. And when Cain heard this, Cain began to wail and says, everybody who finds out about this is going to seek to kill, kill me. And the Lord said this in Genesis chapter 4, in verse um, 15, it says, Therefore the Lord said unto him, Therefore whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on, upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the Lord didn't approve of Cain's sin, murder. He, there were consequences, but God didn't vent the fullness of his anger. Instead, he forbid anybody else from killing Cain. He put a mark on him so that no one would kill Cain. Now contrast that with the very first person who broke the law. Once the law had been given through Moses, here is the first transgression of that law. In uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, it says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done unto him. They knew that God had given the command not to do any work on the Sabbath day, but they didn't know what the punishment was for breaking that command. And so in verse 35 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Man, that's pretty radical. Now, can you see a difference between the way that God dealt with sin prior to the law and the way God dealt with sin after the law? Prior to the law, the very first person to commit murder 
was given protection by God so that nobody could enforce upon him judgment and kill him. God protected the first murderer and gave him freedom and let him go. But after the law was given, the very first person to break the law was a man that picked up sticks and God said, kill him. Show him no mercy. Man, I don't know how anybody can look at those two instances and not see a different side of God under the law versus before the law. And then the Bible says that all of the law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of heaven is preached and the violent take it by force. That's out of Matthew chapter 11, around verses 11 and 12. And so there is a difference. For the first 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, God gave mercy unto mankind, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Romans 5.13 Then during the law... God did impute men's trespasses and kill people for picking up sticks to make a fire so that they could cook some food to eat. But it broke the law and so God said, show them no mercy. Here's wrath. Here's punishment. But now that Jesus has come, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. So for the first 2,000 years, God didn't impute man's sins unto them. Then during the law, he did impute their sins. Then after the law, for 2,000 years, he has not imputed man's sins. And yet the dominant contra uh, characteristic that most people <coughs> have of God is they see this anger and this wrath of God and they think that that's the way that God is. God has revealed himself in mercy much more than he has revealed himself in wrath. The Old Testament law was the wrath of God and there was a period of time that God gave that. I've already explained a lot of these things in prior programs but what I'm trying to do is to show you that God wasn't just the kind that got ticked off and immediately vented his wrath on mankind. He operated in mercy upon man for the first 2,000 years as a general rule. And that's because that is the true nature and the true character of God. He didn't want man to know how sinful they were. You know, when you've done something wrong, when you've transgressed and done something bad to a person, you hate to be around that person. Whether you've ever processed this with your mind or not, that's the reason that you hate to go to church when you've sinned, is because you're afraid that it's going to be thrown up in your face and that you're going to be shamed and embarrassed and made to feel bad. And when you violated or hurt a person, you just don't want to be around them. I even remember a time... Uh, this wasn't something I did intentionally, but I rented a house from a lady in Seagaville, Texas, who was the vice president of the bank. And, uh, you know, I just didn't have the money to pay her. And so I went straight to her the day that the money was due. And I said, I'm sorry I'm late on my rent, but I promise you I am going to make this good. I said, I will pay you. I am not trying to take advantage. I'm just in a bind. And this woman was super nice to me. She says, I know that you're good. She says, you will pay me. She says, don't worry about it. You bring it in as soon as you can. She was very nice to me. And yet, just the fact that I knew that I was indebted to this woman, it bothered me. And I was actually walking down the street in Seagaville, Texas. I saw this banker woman coming down the street towards me and I actually ducked into a Western Auto store acting like I was going to shop. And she actually walked into that same store and I was walking up and down the aisles trying to avoid her. I didn't have a penny in my pocket. I couldn't have bought anything if I'd have wanted to. You know what I was doing? I was just shame. I just hated to face a person. Even though she had been nice to me, I hated to face a person that I was indebted to. And you might have different examples, but it's the exact same thing with everybody. You just don't like to be around people that you feel like that you've offended them or done something against them. Now, if God would have really vented his wrath on Adam and Eve and have just shown them, look what you've done. Look what you've done to my creation. <clears throat> you know, the Bible, according to the scriptural account, all Adam and Eve knew when they sinned was that they were naked. 
They didn't understand what homosexuality was. I don't believe that they understood that someday there would be an entire city, Sodom and Gomorrah, that were cities that were given over to such sexual immorality and impurity that they were going to be totally destroyed. They didn't understand murder at that time. They later learned it through their own children. They didn't understand divorce. I guarantee if they would have understood the concept of divorce, uh, they would have gotten a divorce. If anybody had grounds for divorce, it was Adam. I mean, Eve ate them out of house and home, praise God. He could have divorced her. But they didn't understand divorce. They didn't understand the problems that were going to happen to kids that were raised because their parents had split. They didn't understand any of those things. All they knew was that they were naked. God could have sat them down and said, let me show you. What's going to happen? Let me show you six million Jews that are going to be murdered and burned by a man named Hitler. And let me show you the terrible things that are going to happen in history because of your sin. He could have shown them how angry he was and how damaging their sin was. But you know what? That wasn't the nature of God. God didn't tell them the depths of it. He told them that there's going to be consequences and that you're going to suffer for this. But he didn't vent the fullness of his wrath. Nothing like what he did once the law was given. Once the law was given, God began to show great displeasure towards sin. Why didn't he just show that to Adam and Eve in the beginning? Well, it's my opinion that if he would have shown them all of that, they couldn't have lived with themselves. They could not have survived. And God, out of mercy... He showed them that this was wrong. He drove them out of the Garden of Eden because he loved them and didn't want them to eat and live forever in that fallen state. But God did not reveal his true wrath and hatred against sin because he loved man and he didn't want to drive them from him. He wanted to draw them to him. Man, those are powerful statements. So I've been showing from Scripture that the true nature of God was to love Adam and Eve even after they sinned. He didn't show the completeness of his wrath. He didn't vent the harshness of his punishment upon Adam and Eve the way that he did after the law was given. And you find this consistent. Now there are some examples, some exceptions. I'm going to talk about those. But as a whole, God for the first 2,000 years after the sin of Adam and Eve did not impute their trespasses unto them. For instance, take the example of uh, Noah. Noah is a man that God used, of course, to build the ark and to spare the human race and to preserve them. And yet Noah wasn't a perfect guy. Noah is a guy who got drunk right after he had been through this wonderful uh, deliverance he, got, he planted a vineyard, he got drunk off of it, and it says that he was naked. We don't know, I'm, I'm not clear exactly what that means. I think it was more than him just being without clothes. But anyway, here was a guy who was uh, a drunk and had some other problems, and yet God used him. And the scripture says in Genesis chapter 6 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't find justice. He didn't find this because he was a great holy man. It was the grace of God. God was dealing with mankind by grace. Abraham came along. <clears throat> and I could go into a lot more detail on this, but Abraham is a man that the scripture says in the New Testament in uh, Acts chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us some additional information. And it says that God spoke to Abraham when he was in Ur of the Chaldees to leave his father's house and his brethren and to go into a land that God would show him later. Well, Abraham brought his father with him and they stopped in a place called Haran and they lived there for nearly 20 years until Abraham's father died and then he went and obeyed. He didn't obey God directly. He didn't obey God quickly. And he finally entered into the promised land when he was, in, when he was 75 years old and for the next 26 years, Abraham still was struggling to obey God. He did a number of missteps. He lied about his wife twice and was willing to let other kings take his wife and commit adultery with his wife to save his own hide. Now we sometimes skim over these things because we read them in the Bible and we just somehow or another don't look at this as if it was reality. But you know what? If my wife, if I was willing to let somebody take my wife and go out and commit adultery with her just so I could save my neck, 
Did you know I'd be condemned and rightfully so for that? That's wrong. Abraham didn't do that just once. He did it twice. And then when it looked like that his wife Sarah was getting too old to have children, she decided, you need to go into my handmaid and have sex with her, and maybe that's the way God's going to fulfill this. And there isn't any instance in Scripture that Abraham argued with Sarah. It sounds like he was pretty prone to do this. And he went in, and that caused the whole Arab-Israeli conflict that we see today was born out of Abraham and Sarah's self-will and disobedience. And then there was a number of other things. But you could turn over to Leviticus chapter 18. Now this is after the law was given. And in Leviticus 18, it lists all kinds of sexual immoralities and things that were prohibited. And one of those things was that you couldn't marry a half-sister. Well, Abraham married his half-sister, Sarah. And Leviticus 18 says that if you do that, it's an abomination in the sight of God. This person must be cut off which if you study the Old Testament, the word cut off means to be put to death. Abraham, if he would have been living under the time that the law was given, he did a number of things wrong that would have brought the wrath and the punishment of God. Leviticus 18, he had to be stoned to death for marrying a half-sister. And yet, prior to the law, God didn't hold those things against Abraham. As a matter of fact, Abraham is the only person who was ever called the friend of God under the Old Covenant. Twice he was referred to as the friend of God. God showed favoritism and blessings upon Abraham, not because Abraham had his act together completely. Abraham had some serious problems, and yet he was the friend of God and the one that God used to bring his covenant of grace into the whole earth. If you were looking for it, you could find that God, for the first 2,000 years after the fall of Adam, didn't deal with people according to their sins. He didn't impute their trespasses unto them, but he was operating with people in mercy. And then you can find Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who married two sisters, Leah and, and Rachel. And these two were sisters, and according to Leviticus 18, you couldn't marry two sisters while those two sisters were still alive. Now, you could marry a woman, and if she died, you could have married her sister, but you couldn't marry her sister while the first woman was still alive. And Jacob did that. So according to Leviticus 18, Jacob, who later wrestled with an angel and prevailed and be, was renamed Israel, uh, Jacob, or Israel, was worthy of being stoned to death if they would have lived under the Old Testament law. And yet, instead of being stoned to death, this is the very one that God blessed. And God literally said, you've prevailed with me and renamed him and made him one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. You know, God was dealing with people in mercy. And yet, most people have this impression that God was just harsh and angry and bitter and releasing his wrath. But no, God was dealing with mankind in mercy for the first 2,000 years. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Some of the noticeable exceptions are when God destroyed the earth with a flood and all but eight people were killed during the days of Noah. That's recorded in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And then also the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's recorded in... I believe it's Genesis chapter 20. And some people say, well, isn't that God releasing his wrath on sin? Well, yes it is, but let me put it to you this way. Here's the way that I harmonize all of this with Romans 5.13 that says, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no, uh, when there is no law. The way I harmonize this is to compare it to like a person. If you have an infection in your body, say for instance, if you got some kind of an infection in your foot and that infection was beginning to get into your bloodstream and go throughout your entire body. Sometimes we will amputate a toe or a foot or a leg in order to keep the infection from killing the entire body. Now that's terrible punishment and harshness on that individual part that was cut off because that means it's going to die. It can't live being separated from the body. But if you look on the body as a whole, it's actually an act of mercy to cut off a person's toe or foot and, and rather than letting their entire body die. And I see this as the way that God uh, conducted himself when he destroyed 
the earth with the flood and killed all but eight people and when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was terrible judgment on those individuals who received it, but as a whole, it was an act of mercy. If God hadn't have released his judgment and have literally purged the earth from this corruption and sin that was flowing through these people, then the human race would have been so defiled that there wouldn't have been a virgin left for Mary to, I mean, there wouldn't have been a virgin left for Jesus to have been born through the Virgin Mary. That's how corrupt those cultures were. And so God literally had to just bring harsh judgment upon those people. And some people may say, well, that's a violation of what it says in Romans 5.13. Well, on the individuals, it was imputing their sins unto them. But on the human race as a whole, it was still God dealing in mercy. He just every once in a while had to purge this sin to keep it from overwhelming and stopping his plan of redemption. But I believe that as a general whole, what is said in Romans 5.13 about where there is no, when there is no law, uh, God does not impute sin. I believe that that is an absolutely true statement and it characterizes the first 2,000 years after the fall of Adam until the time that the law came and it summarizes the way that God dealt with the human race. As a whole, he was dealing with the human race in mercy not imputing their sins unto them. Then there came the 2,000 year period of time where he did impute people's sins unto them and he showed a harshness and a severity that literally was intended to scare the devil out of people, to make them quit going out and yielding to sin and also to make them aware that, you know what, if this is what God's standard is, I'm so far short of it that I can't save myself. I have to have mercy. I have to throw myself upon God and just call out for mercy. That's what the law was all about. But when Jesus came, the Lord brought in mercy to the human race in a way that it had never been exposed before. And uh, since the time of Jesus, the grace of God has once again been operating and God hasn't been giving people what they deserve. Boy, that is a different opinion of the nature of God than what most people have. And yet I believe that that is a scriptural opinion based primarily on Romans 5, 13, where it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. And so this is what we've been sharing on this, and I've still got a lot more to share about this, but we're going to have to continue that on our programs next week.